<laughs> what kind of sadistic person, what kind of sadistic show chooses the beginning of March to do what we're about to do tonight? What are we going to do tonight? Full SEC coaching staffs graded, not just the head coach kids, the coaching staff. Thankless behavior, thankless work being done on this show. We're jam-packed high atop a lovely downtown Nashville, Tennessee tonight, Sunday, March 3rd, the year of our Lord, 2024. Yes, SEC coaching staffs. We're grading them tonight. We are ranking them. We're not even power rating. It's actual rankings we're dropping on you tonight. I'm going to talk about that. Johnny Manziel, pretty outspoken this week about something I hold near and dear to my heart, and that is Heisman foolishness. Therefore, we will discuss that tonight. I've got some sleeping giant programs that we need to talk about. That's just code for, yeah, we're probably going to talk Nebraska at some point during the show. All that, I've got, uh, what else, Jesse? The top quarterback rooms in the sport this year. And also, as you know, we were down in Athens last week, had a really, really positively received one-on-one -on -one conversation with Kirby Smart. That's on the channel now if you want to watch it or listen to it. But also, hey man, we saw a lot down there. Some of it we can't talk about. Some of it we can talk about. Some of it I can be kind of vague about. But I'm going to tell you as much as I can, give you a little scoop about our trip down to Athens. And we got like a dozen or two dozen more of those trips coming at various points this spring. They're watching us in Bartlesville, Oklahoma, Olympia, Washington, Mykonos, Greece, and Meridianville, Alabama. Thank you guys so much. As I said, the Pate State Speaker Series has cranked up. We're going to be all over the country this spring. I am not releasing a promotional poster or dates. I'll just let you know when it's time, but we're going to be coast to coast. We will be all over the country. We'll be in every major conference, and uh, it's going to be fun. It's going to be fun. Got a lot of big names lined up and a lot of live shows on the road at various universities. So that's for then. This is for now. How should I best intro this segment, Colin? This one's going to be dirty now. This one's going to make us no friends out there. But you know what? It ain't me. It's the model. Yes, I say that during the season all the time, but I'm also saying it now. It's not me. It's the model. So here we go. Colin, here's your end point. I realized a long time ago that if I was going to properly rank head coaches and coaching staffs, I just needed to remove myself from the equation. I don't trust my gut on this stuff. I don't trust my instinct because I like coaches too much. I enjoy hanging out with them. Candidly, I enjoy conversing with coaches more than I do talking to people in my own industry. And so I realized I needed to get myself out of there because I would be too, I would be too lenient and I would be stopping well short of criticizing these guys. So we needed some lifeless, emotionless grading criteria and scales and variables, and we got it. And this thing has been so dialed in that I realized it's one of the most effective mechanisms that we have in-house here. And thus far, I had not ever shared any of it. But I told Jesse, I told Colin, we need to start sharing this stuff. So tonight, we're going to show you some of our grading and some of our tiers for every SEC coaching staff, not just head coach, but coaching staffs. Experience matters a whole lot in this. We, we heavily value experience, games coached overall. Head coach to the coordinators to then the support staff, which is the position coaches, is how the funnel works and how we prioritize and weight our grading scale. And it is amazing to see how much movement there is in modern day college football any given year. What percentage of a staff turns over? Can you keep your head coach, offensive coordinator, defense coordinator? Uh, special teams moves. Oklahoma made a massive special teams coordinator hire. Texas has got one of the best offensive coordinator, defensive coordinator, special teams coordinator combos in college football. So all this stuff, so fascinating to look at. Let's dive into this, okay? I'm not giving you this in any particular order, but I am going to give you tiers. Tier one in the SEC right now. Ole Miss has a tier one coaching staff in the SEC. I think that surprises a lot of you. Candidly, it surprises me that Lane Kiffin has gotten his overall staff to tier one status in the most talent rich environment in America, the Southeastern Conference. A lot of people look at Ole Miss and they think transfer portal. You think talent acquisition. You may not think elite coaching staff. They got a tier one coaching staff down here now. They, when accounting for staff changes, and overall staff grading changes, they upgraded at all 11 spots. Ole Miss across the board upgraded from what they had this time last year. They added 274 games of overall coaching experience, which is a huge upgrade. And defensive support grade jumped big time with the additions they made. Ole Miss has a Tier 1 coaching staff right now in the SEC. Now, it's not going to surprise you. The next team is Georgia on the list. So 
Georgia's absolutely got a tier one coaching staff. They had the number one staff in the SEC last year. Through the losses and the additions they just made, it's crazy that their net score is unchanged. It's like not even plus or minus 1%. It's pretty unchanged in our model here. I don't expect that to change. As long as Kirby Smart's there and that infrastructure's in place, they're always going to have a tier one staff in the SEC. Head coach, offensive coordinator, and defensive coordinator return. And it's a machine there in Athens. There actually is not a whole lot more to say about them. That's not a surprise. The next team, I think, is going to surprise you, maybe to the degree that Ole Miss surprises you. Auburn University right now, tier one coaching staff in the SEC. Hugh Freeze has a lot to do with that. But you may think to yourself, like I do, they lost both coordinators. They upgraded. In the aggregate, they upgraded. Now, that overall staff upgrading despite losing... Two coordinators, you can make of that what you want to. They added 176 games of overall coaching experience. The offensive support staff is down just a little bit, but the defensive support staff grade is actually up. And so I'm showing you on the screen right now some of the guys they hired. Like they added DJ Durkin, defensive coordinator, linebacker coach. You can have whatever personal opinion you want of the guy. I care strictly about numbers. He's not even a person to this model. It's just a bunch of numbers. Charles Kelly came in as co-DC, big-time addition there. And Auburn, in the aggregate, an actual Tier 1 coaching staff in the SEC. I don't think many people would place them there if you just went off gut feel, Auburn, off the top of your head. What do you think? And that includes me. I would not have put them there. But the overall system that we trust implicitly does put them there. Where's Alabama? Is Alabama still in the Tier 1? Yes, they are. Alabama is a tier one coaching staff. Nick Saban steps out. Kalen DeBoer steps in. Now, I got to tell you something. About a month ago, when DeBoer had come in and he had hired Ryan Grubb as his offensive coordinator and Scott Huff was going to be the offensive line coach, that staff, if you pressed pause on it, was going to be one of our three best in America. It's still one of the top 10, top 15 best in America. It is still good for tier one status in the SEC, but those were losses. So there's no way around that. Those were losses. Uh, they, they lose a lot of experience. So this is where you have to maybe insert yourself a little bit, immunity. They lost 223 games of overall coaching experience. Well, that can very easily be dedicated to just losing Nick Saban, who's been around forever, and replacing him with Kalen DeBoer. That's a ton of experience that you lose. Not to mention the experience is on the shoulders of Nick literal Saban that you're losing. The defensive support staff, though, is what stands out here. Okay, you had Alabama under Nick Saban last year, and then DeBoer comes in, and I've been telling you, I think if you drill down a little bit, they upgraded parts of this coaching staff. They upgraded their defensive support staff is what they did. Colin Hitchler, for example, is, I believe, the safeties coach there. Uh, That's a big-time get. That's one of the rising star names in this business. It's one of the names that we have circled. Their defensive support staff is up nearly 9% from what Nick Saban had last year. So you think Kalen DeBoer, you think offensive-minded guy, it's the defense that got upgraded here. Those are the Tier 1 coaching staffs in the SEC right now. Ole Miss, Georgia, Auburn, Bama, that is in no particular order. Now we go to Tier 2. Again, in no particular order. Missouri, a Tier 2 coaching staff in the SEC. Big note here, okay? You know we're sky high on Kevin Peoples. He was the D-line coach there last year. Along with Blake Baker, the defensive coordinator, Brian Kelly took them both. They both went to LSU. So I'm thinking to myself, that's going to be tough for Eli Drinkwitz. That's a massive drop-off. I mean, just Kevin Peoples alone is a, it's a huge, like, rock star name in the future of coaching on the defensive side. And then he goes down to Houston. He gets Brian Early. Early is a – we would have him graded a 4.5-star caliber defensive line coach. Somehow – Eli Drinkwitz lost stud defensive staffers and their defensive support staff grade went up. I don't know that there is a guy who's better at hiring in this conference right now than Eli Drinkwitz, especially when you account for the fact that he's working in a little bit of a disadvantaged position because he's the head coach at Missouri and not Georgia or not Alabama or not LSU. In fact, he's losing staffers two programs like LSU, and finding a way to upgrade, and he's not replacing trash. Like, he's replacing really good coaches. They had the third biggest staff improvement grade across the board in the SEC, and Eli Drinkwitz's grade also improved because last year, since this is a living, breathing grade, 
last year did them a lot of favors too. But uh, Missouri's got a legit coaching staff. I told you coming into last year, I think you'd be surprised if you knew they have one of the 20 to 25 best staffs in the country. Um, maybe people will still be surprised to know that's about where they're going to be again this year. They are a really solid, high-level Tier 2 coaching staff in the SEC, which places you way up there nationally. You notice I had not mentioned Texas yet, which uh, candidly surprised me a little bit. I didn't cheat on this. I didn't look ahead of time. I knew we were going to do this show in this segment, so I did not look ahead of time. I would have thought Texas was going to be a Tier 1 staff. Texas, Texas, it may surprise you a little bit, is a Tier 2 staff in the SEC. Tier 2 in the SEC is really good. But when you dive into it a little bit and you know what we value, especially in terms of experience, it's not so surprising. So Bo Davis went to LSU. If you're noticing a theme, LSU really upgraded defensively. We'll get to that in a second. Bo Davis was a four-star caliber defensive line coach. Known commodity, been around forever. They replaced him with Kenny Baker. Kenny Baker came there by way of the Dolphins, but he has no experience. So the experience inversion there is going to downgrade their overall support staff grade defensively quite a bit. But here's the thing about Texas. When you look at the OCDC special teams coordinator combo, which is a grade that some people in our organization like to value a lot, they are the highest graded staff in America when you go coordinators, including special teams combined. Uh, because Texas has studs at all three positions there. You got Sarkoff, obviously, is the OC there. Uh, Pete Kwiatkowski is the DC, and then Jeff Banks, who's been at Bama and been at Texas now. Uh, they are about as good as it gets in college football at those three positions. Speaking of LSU, LSU, solid Tier 2 coaching staff in the SEC right now. It was the lowest graded defensive staff in the conference last year, which is exactly why they looked the way they did on the field last year. No excuse for LSU to ever be that bad on the defensive side of the ball. Well, they realized it. And sure, there was nowhere to go but up, but they really, really, really went up. They led the SEC in defensive staff upgrade at nearly 25%, which I know doesn't mean a lot to you unless you understand how this model works. It's a huge jump. Uh, Kevin Peoples, as I told you, new defensive line guy there. He's big time. They added Bo Davis as well. Uh, both of those are four-star plus guys just being added on the D-line. They added 245 games of experience. And listen, they lost Dembrot. They lost a 4.5-star caliber offensive coordinator tight ends coach, or they'd be up there in Tier 1 right now. That's what drug LSU as a staff grade down just below Tier 1 status, but they couldn't have knocked it out of the park anymore on their defensive upgrades. Now, does that mean they're going to immediately just poof, be a top 10 defense this year overnight? No, it won't because I don't think they have the personnel to be that yet, but they will be a heck of a lot better than they were last year. And there's another Tier 2 staff out there. Where do you think it may be? It's probably in Knoxville, Tennessee. So Tennessee, also a Tier 2 SEC coaching staff right now. Their overall grade is pretty unchanged from last year. They gained 152 games of overall experience. There is not a whole lot to say about Tennessee because, like I said, it didn't fluctuate a whole lot. It's just a really solid Tier 2 staff in the SEC. And obviously, as you go further and further down the road, you've got a chance to keep the same guys. Like Heupel could be the head coach there. And if they pop a 10 or 11 win season on you this year and their offensive production's through the roof, his grade could increase and therefore their standing overall could increase. This stuff changes year to year. It's not static and it's emotionless too. So it doesn't really matter whether you like Tennessee or not. This thing has no clue who Josh Heupel is. It just sees the title head coach and then it plugs in the numbers accordingly. All right, let's get into tier three because there are some names conspicuous in their absence right now that I know we're about to hear a lot about. Oklahoma, we've got as a tier three coaching staff in the SEC right now. Their overall staff grade increased 14% from last year. Brent Venable's head coaching grade accounted for a lot of that. His head coaching grade increased. As you could imagine, when you've got no head coaching experience, and then your first year is as his was, and then you have year two, like he did last year, it's going to increase pretty substantially. Their offensive support staff dipped. Defensive support staff grade rose. They made a monster special teams coordinator hire at Oklahoma. One of the biggest head scratchers we had is watching Doug Deacon, who was the special teams coordinator at San Diego State. 
he comes into Oklahoma, there should have been about a 17-way bidding war for this guy's services. And as far as we could tell, he did not have a lot of traction out there, did not have a ton of major offers. And whatever Brent Venable saw, in our opinion, was the proper view uh, because Deacon is a massive special teams coordinator hire for Oklahoma. Like, watch that pay dividends immediately for them this year. Next up, Mark Stoops did some work. Once the season ended, if I believed in the word offseason, I'd use it here. Mark Stoops got it done. Ever since last season ended, they had the biggest offensive support staff increase in the SEC at Kentucky. They went and got Shorts, who's the wide receivers coach, big-time upgrade. I mean, big-time positional grade increase there. Their total staff grade at Kentucky's up over 4%. Had an excellent cycle. They also went and got Wolford back from Alabama. He was the offensive line coach that left there a couple of years ago. Uh, but to kill shorts, that's the wide receiver coach. That's the one we circle. That was the big get, in our opinion, for Mark Stoops. And that's not a name that's going to grab a lot of headlines, but that's not what we build this for. Again, emotionless. Just care about grading, guys. And to kill shorts is a big-time get from Mark Stoops. Okay, let's talk about Florida. So I was waiting to get to this one. The Florida Gators right now, we think, have a Tier 3 coaching staff in the SEC. They had big-time shuffle down there. Uh, the DB and offensive or outside linebackers positions, we think, upgraded in the aggregate. But the defensive line change did drop their overall defensive support staff grade. Austin Armstrong's the DC there. His grade dropped last year. And that brought the overall staff grade down pretty significantly because obviously coordinators are right below head coaches in terms of what we weight the heaviest. I'm very interested to see what the staff does this year because also along with additions, you have rumors of you know changing and redelegating responsibilities and various play calling roles and all of that's rumor until you get to actual nuts and bolts of fall camp and install and then you get to the season. Then we find out. But right now we got Florida as pretty solid staff. It's a tier three staff. I know that sounds bad. It, it's really not. Like it's there are a lot of really competitive staffs in the SEC, really good staffs. When you got a lot of money to spend, that's what you can do. Texas A&M, wanted to talk to you about them too. Texas A&M's got an entirely new staff. We've got it initially pegged as a tier three staff. In the SEC, it's the second biggest offensive support staff jump right behind Kentucky in the entire conference. They got better on the offensive side of the ball. I don't think that shocks many people. They got better over there. Now, here's what I'm waiting to see. I'm waiting to see who calls the defense. Mike Elko is the new head coach there. And Jay Bateman is the new defensive coordinator. I want to know who's calling the defense there because it would matter a pretty great deal. This model is sitting here telling me if Elko's the one calling the defense, it would be worth a lot more in defensive staff grade than if Jay Bateman is. It's not down on Bateman. It's just way up on Mike Elko. Excellent base setup here, though. So this is a foundation. And then this time next year, A&M's coaching staff grade could fluctuate pretty wildly because there's a lot of inexperience. There's a lot of new. That's the case anytime you have a new coaching staff. It, this is not predictive, though. The point is, I'm really big on Mike Elko, and this is me personally talking. I'm really big on Elko. Even if the overall system was predictive and it was high on Elko, this is not a predictive grade. This is a here and now grade. That would be like if the thermometer says 74 right now, but there's a snowstorm predicted for tomorrow. The thermometer is not going to proactively go down to 32. It's going to wait for the conditions to change, and it will respond accordingly. So this is meant to give us a real-time grade based on the criteria and the proper factors on coaching staffs. All right, so those are the top three tiers that we've got in the SEC. Now, here's what I chose not to do. I chose not to lay out all of the rest of the conference because it's already a 20-minute segment, but I did want to specify something. With South Carolina... South Carolina, we did not have in the first three tiers there. They have 452 combined games of coaching experience on that staff at South Carolina. That makes them the least experienced staff in the SEC. That matters for us. That matters for the way that we weight things. That means you need patience because it could be a really good staff and we just don't know it. But what we are not doing is building a model that's predictive or instinct-based. We are building it based on results. And so for all we know, Shane Beamer's got the best staff in the SEC. He could have the worst staff in the SEC, but if it's that inexperienced, 
at the very least, the model's going to take a wait-and-see approach on it. Uh, their staff grades also dropped, therefore, in all three coaching sectors. Again, inexperience, patience. And I also wanted to mention Mississippi State because it's the same song and dance there. Jeff Lebby's the new head coach. He's never been a head coach before. There's not a lot of experience on the staff. Head coach and defensive coordinator have zero games experience at their current positions. They could knock it out of the park. Okay, Does, It's not predictive. just means there's no, there's no experience there. It's going to take a wait-and-see approach. But I will tell you one thing I'm personally watching. Jeff Lebby is a top 1% play caller in terms of pace of play. When you combine that with an inexperienced or first-time defensive coordinator, it normally does not bode well. And that's just speaking historically for obvious reasons. If I got to do calling plays at a million miles an hour over there, usually it means my defense is going to be forced into sudden situations more and there are going to be more quick transitions and I'm going to have to be on the field more. And if I don't know what I'm doing, which some inexperienced guys don't, then it could be a long season. So those are some things that we're watching. SEC coaching staff grades. Now, I know the comment section will be on fire. Here's what I'm asking you to do. Don't just tell me if you disagree with something that you think it's wrong. Tell me why you think it's wrong. Give me your grading system. Give me your criteria because I, I laid out ours as best I can. I'm not fully raising the curtain on it. But um, I'm, I'll be happy to go back and forth with this because I know why the model thinks what it thinks. And I don't even necessarily agree across the board with everything we have. But I do know why we have what we have. All right, nice little hello, nice little introduction to the show tonight. Late Kick Live is the name of the show, and we do it oh, a couple times a week, throw in a podcast midweek for fun. Uh, you know, I should tell you, while I have you here, I am sometimes very quick to forget how many new people we add to the show every month, okay? So sometimes I have to remind the newcomers that, number one, we're happy to have you, number two, the way we do things this time of year Sunday night, Thursday night, we have a live show. Tuesday, sometime during the day, an extra podcast drops. We literally call it the Late Kick Extra Podcast, but it's not on YouTube. You may see some random clips from it, but the entire thing is podcast form only, which means you got to go wherever you listen to podcasts and subscribe while you're there. So if you're not seeing it, if you hear me talking about something, but you're looking on the YouTube channel and you don't see it, that's why. It's a crazy little scheme we have to drive subscriptions in both places. And since both places are free to subscribe, we don't think it's too much to ask. Humbly. Maybe we're wrong, but we don't think it's too much to ask. All right, I've got, I got so many places to go tonight, so just settle in. We're just getting started. I have this, mm, I have this thing about Johnny Menzel I'm going to talk about later. I'm really fired up about it. I'm glad he did what he did. And if you don't know what he did yesterday or two days ago, we'll talk about it. Mm. But in the meantime, if I were to ask you, what are the top quarterback rooms in college football this upcoming year? Just like rattle them off the top of your head. Where would you go? Because someone asked me that at the gym. So I said, Jesse, throw it into the show. Let's talk about it. Texas has got to be up there. Okay, Quinn Ewers. And a little side conversation about this is how good is Quinn Ewers? It's NFL draft time and combine time right now. A year from now. He'll be under a whole lot of scrutiny, but I think we can get ahead of the curve there. But anyway, that's for another day. You got Quinn Ewers there, a lot of experience now. Arch Manning is the heir apparent. Trey Owens is a four-star kid they just signed. He won't figure into things this year, but we're talking about depth of the quarterback room, so that matters. I trust Steve Sarkeesian implicitly as a play caller and developer at the quarterback position, even without Malik Murphy, who transferred out of there to Duke. Uh, this right here is one of the best quarterback rooms in college football. Oregon? Uh, hold on, keep that up for a second there, uh, Colin, because Quinn Ewers, I was asking that question about him. 300 or more passing yards in six games last year. Yet he was surrounded with weaponry and, again, one of the very best play callers in college football, in my opinion. And my question is, how do you think about him? We're in this world now where you're either elite or you're trash. Quinn Ewers is neither of those. I look at him as a pretty good college quarterback. With the ceiling, probably a little bit higher than what he's reached so far. That's okay. Like God gives you three or four years to play this sport for a reason, as Meemaw used to say. What's reasonable to expect? A.D. Mitchell, Xavier Worthy, Whittington, uh, Jatavian Sanders are all out the door this year. They got to hope that they hit big time in the portal. 
What's reasonable? Is there another notch or two up the ladder that he can climb this year? All right. Uh, those, are, those are kind of rhetorical. Those are, those are future-facing questions. Oregon, certainly, certainly, one of the best quarterback rooms in the country is in Eugene, Oregon. Dylan Gabriel, they just added via the portal. Dante Moore, they just added via the portal. This is college football circa 2024. Because this time last year, we had no clue either of these guys could even point to Oregon on a map, much less actually find their way there to play. Yeah, Moore probably could because he visited there and he was committed there at one point. But you get what I mean. Dylan Gabriel. I don't pick fights internally here. It's just not good business. But our 24-7 sports portal rankings had Gabriel, Jesse, what was it, as the number 12 overall quarterback. And I look at that and I just shake my head. Reasonable minds can disagree. There were not 12 better available at the position than Dylan Gabriel. And I'm going to go ahead and tell you, I don't think there was one or two better. I have to cover my mouth like Gus Malzahn when I say that, so they can't read my lips. Uh, Gabriel was uh, their best option, and they went and got him. So as far as I'm concerned, they hit a home run, maybe a grand slam at Oregon. And then, for good measure, they went and got Dante Moore, who, in a, in a rare, rare move this day and age, serves as their next guy. So they went and got their initial guy and their next guy, both out of the portal, and Gabriel last year, over 3,000 yards, 30 touchdowns, six interceptions, added 12 more on the ground. I was there at the Cotton Bowl when he did what he did against Texas. So, yeah, I don't think Oregon could have done 12 guys better than Dylan Gabriel this past cycle in the portal. Let us talk about the Florida Gators for the second time tonight, but in a much different context. One of the great mysteries of last year was how bad as a team Florida ended up being despite how good, secretly, Graham Mertz ended up being at quarterback. Because i got to give Billy Napier a lot of credit. He talked all last summer about how they evaluated the entire portal and they looked at all the quarterbacks available and they thought that Mertz was the best option for them. And you know what? He was right. Graham Mertz had a pretty good year last year. And now they added DJ Lagway, who is the future at the position. But in the meantime, Graham Mertz has come back and last year, 20 touchdowns, three picks, was a 73% completion guy. I mean, they've got, they've got good enough talent at quarterback, both now and in the future. And it's why it's, it's tough. I know you may view Florida football as being on life support. And a lot of people are going to have that staff on their hot seat lists. And I don't know that that's unfair. I'm just saying, when you check the quarterback box, it's tough for me to just write you off completely. Maybe, maybe that'll happen despite the quarterback position, but it's tough for me to write teams off when I like them the way I do Florida at the quarterback position. What about Ohio State? A lot of fun and exciting times ahead in Columbus. So Ryan Day goes out and he gets Will Howard out of the portal. That was the quarterback at Kansas State last year. And you know they already got Devin Brown, who was locked in that battle with Kyle McCord this time last year. Then they went and got Bama's five-star kid in Julian Sayan. And they've got their own in Aaron Nolan. And so they've got a loaded quarterback room by depth standards. But the irony is Will Howard figures to be the starter this year. And he's not a surefire stud. Like, he's, he's not surefire all Big Ten potential. He's shown that he's a pretty good player at the position. And certainly he won't have to shoulder the entire load. They got a dominant one-two in the backfield. They will have one of the best defenses in the country, so we're not looking for a guy to put up pinball numbers here. But we are looking for a guy to make the right decisions in the three or four clutch moments this year that it'll take for them to be a 10-win team versus going to the national championship. And so this is interesting. Chip Kelly has come in there as well as the offensive coordinator. It's interesting because if we were talking about overall quarterback rooms, which we are, Ohio State's way up there. But if we're talking about ranking starting quarterbacks, I don't know that they've got a top five guy in the country right now if it's Will Howard. But he's good enough for them to win with. So, interesting times. Uh, what about Georgia? We were down there last week. Uh, to say that Georgia has breathed a sigh of relief the size of Athens with Carson Beck choosing to return would be an understatement. I know that you know how big a deal it is for him to return, but you're still not viewing it in nearly as big a terms as they are because this is a total game changer for them to get him to return. I think Carson Beck's the most important returning quarterback in the country this year. 
4,000-yard guy last year, nearly, 72% completion, uh, 24 to 6 TD to INT ratio. And even after they lost Riola, he decommitted and he goes to Nebraska. They got Ryan Puglisi, uh, who candidly I love just as much as Riola did, or I did Riola. So Gunnar Stockton's there as well. Uh, they've got a really, really good quarterback room there. And also, let's not kid ourselves, much like Oregon on the West Coast, Georgia's going to be a prime destination if they do ever need to go to the portal to pick up guys at that position as well. And Alabama's got to be up here as well. So we get an offensive-minded head coach in Kalen DeBoer that comes in who has got a track record of squeezing every ounce of potential out of every quarterback he's ever touched. And then Jalen Milrose there, who had a good but far from perfect season last year. There's still a lot of his game that could be improved. And now that's what Kalen DeBoer inherits. But also, they got Ty Simpson still there. Dylan Lonergan is an extremely underrated guy that they talk a lot about internally, but no one else in America knows anything about yet. And then they imported Austin Mack. Austin Mack was up there with them at Washington last year, and they brought him in via transfer to Alabama. Austin Mack is, um, how should I describe him? He makes Jalen Milrow look pretty average size by comparison, and Milrow is a tank. Austin Mack is just a monster and uh, has, hasn't really started or anything like that, but they think he may be the future there. So I don't expect all four of those guys to stay at Alabama, but in the here and now, Bama's got one of the best quarterback rooms in the country as well. All right, let's move along. Let's move along. Hey, I'm going to show you something randomly. Do you see this? You see this picture? This is in my notes right now. If you're listening on podcast, just picture a skeleton holding a cup of coffee. Like, what could that possibly be in my notes for? I promise there will come a point in this show tonight where that picture makes sense. You know how rarely I believe in using visual aids. Look at how bland this background is. You're lucky it's even colored. So, yeah, it's going to be a happening show eventually tonight. Uh, Jesse, did we have a question about Sleeping Giant programs? I'm looking at the feed over here. I'm looking at the delayed feed on my laptop, and I'm just now holding up the picture of that skeleton and creep me out a little bit. Oh, a text from Billy Lucci. It's good to hear from him. All right, yeah, we got one from Seth. Seth in Boston asked me, what Sleeping Giant program would you most like to see return to the top of the sport in 2024? Now, Seth, I don't know that any of these programs are going all the way to the mountaintop in 2024, but I do have four of them that I just wanted to discuss briefly. I got some eye-popping numbers, maybe some paper-popping numbers here. So Nebraska is always the go-to here because when I was a youth down in Georgia, Nebraska was a superpower. And I also learned about Nebraska from once upon a time, way back in the day. They were a superpower then as well. And then whatever changed about college football changed, and it seemed to have left Nebraska behind. And there is a debate even today about whether Nebraska could ever ascend back to the mountaintop. We view their mountaintop, obviously, as the Tom Osborne 90s era Nebraska teams. Did you know that there was a period from 08 to 2014 where they had seven straight nine-plus win seasons. I don't even think people remember this nationally. Nebraska fans probably do. Bo Pelini, hardly anyone liked as a dude, and so they really were willing to overlook the fact that he was putting up pretty decent numbers as a head coach, but they thought they could do better. It's like Dan Mullen at Florida. Numbers were good. They thought they could do better, so they got rid of him, and they haven't been back there since. They have not had a winning record since 2016. So... Enter Matt Rule and uh, Dylan Riola. They got him to decommit from Georgia. So you got the, the quarterback box checked, hopefully. I'm sky high on their defense and their defensive staff. Like They got a really, really underrated good defensive staff. Mountaintop, can Nebraska get back there? I'd love to see it. They're over under this year's seven and a half wins. So it's unlikely that they're you know knocking on the door of the title game this year. But it would be fun. And a nice little experiment about the future of college football and what is and isn't possible. Uh, Speaking of programs that really were getting it done back in the 90s and 2000s, Virginia Tech would love to see Virginia Tech reascend. So Frank Beamer gets hired there in 87. He did not have a six or more win season for six years. Would Frank Beamer even be able to make it to year seven? This day and age, I don't think he would. But they hung in there with him at Virginia Tech. 
And so he gets hired in 87, doesn't even pop a six or more win season on him until, what, 1993. But then from 95 to 2011, here's how the patience paid off. They had eight or more wins 16 of those 17 years. 13 of the 17 years in that time frame, they had double-digit win seasons. And if you're in my high school or college age crowd, you don't remember Virginia Tech as being a national powerhouse. Virginia Tech was a national powerhouse. And it could be again. I think that one of the biggest stories in college sports and college football the past couple of decades has been the ACC as a collective totally dropping the ball. Clemson covered up a lot of really mediocre, below average play there because Clemson was carrying the entire torch for the conference. Uh, Florida State for a long time, not nearly what they should have been. Miami has not been at all what they should be. The Virginia schools have dropped the ball fantastically. North Carolina should be so much better than they have been, but none of them have been. And so Virginia Tech, it it would be nice if one or more of them would step back on the main stage because Florida State's doing their part now. Clemson's been done their part. Brent Pry uh, just had a first winning season there since 2019. So early returns are good for the staff. Again, we're talking about getting to the mountaintop. Like Mike Vick played for a national championship at Virginia Tech. Could they ever get back there? Time will tell. What about Tennessee? Tennessee, uh, nothing's changed about the structure of the sport. Like it's still built for Tennessee. Phil Fulmer won a national title there in 1998. He won, well, he and other coaches won nine or more games 15 times from 89 to 2007. And unlike some of these other programs where you think that things have to change fundamentally, nothing about college football needs to change fundamentally for Tennessee to go back to the mountaintop. Like the only thing that's been in Tennessee's way is Tennessee and occasionally a misguided NCAA investigation or two, but by and large, they've taken care of that. So they they dropped the elbow on the NCAA, but Tennessee could not get out of Tennessee's own way for a long time. There is nothing about the sport holding them back. One of the hottest debates I remember ever having in my radio days was I would get uh, fans sometimes that would call in, and this is like Derek Dooley era Tennessee, and they would be calling and saying Tennessee just can't win anymore. They can't win a national title anymore. The sports passed them by. I'm like, what are you talking about the sports passed them by? Nothing changed. It still takes the same thing to win today. They still have the same resources they always had. It's just that they can't get out of their own way. It's really, hard to, it's really hard to have the kind of synergy in place that it takes to, to win at the highest levels. That's why you appreciate, even when these rich programs are able to pull it off, you appreciate it because there are a lot of rich programs out there delivering poverty results, as Meemaw would say. So Tennessee, just they, they were secret poverty for a little while, but the resources never were. The access to talent never was. Neyland Stadium wasn't any less awesome on Saturday because Tennessee was struggling to make a bowl game. But they could be back there tomorrow. They could be right back there, and they're not that far away. The odds to win the SEC championship this year, they've got the sixth best odds. Like, they they won't be too far down the national championship odds board. They're a player now. Uh, But taking that next step, that that would get them back into territory that, again, if you're in my college-age crowd, you've never seen them occupy. And you knew I wasn't doing this segment without mentioning Miami. Please. Yeah, Miami belongs here. Yeah, I'd love to see Miami as one of the prime players in college football again. Their last national title was in 01. But, oh, friends, from 1983 to 2003, 14 of those 21 seasons, Miami won double-digit games, and they have only won one double-digit season since 04. Did the structure of the sport change? Not necessarily. It's just Miami being in Miami's own way. And if Miami gets out of Miami's own way, Miami can do special things again. I don't think it helped they tore down the Orange Bowl either. But you know what? Um, I, am, I am a believer in the Los Angeles Dodgers philosophy of Miami home games. You will have to provide the folks a winner. But if you do provide them a winner, they will show up. They will show up. But unlike some of these places with blind loyalty, they are not showing up if you're anything less than a winner. The number one ingredient in this sport to win at the highest levels has always been and will always be talent. Having the ingredients does not guarantee a good meal, but not having the ingredients guarantees starvation. One of my most famous quotes, she wasn't talking about Miami, but in this case, we're talking about Miami. 
So Nebraska, Virginia Tech, Tennessee, Miami, give them to me. Would love to have every single one of them back at the party. We're going to talk about Michigan, aren't we? And then we're going to talk about Johnny Manziel. Johnny Manziel's just holding the Heisman hostage in a way. Will it work? I'll talk to you about it. Hold on. We have to take a sip from the chalice. We have to reapply our lip balm, being very careful with the form we use because haters are everywhere waiting to pounce. Uh, show me that tweet about Michigan there, Colin. Thank you so much. Logan from Mount Pleasant, Michigan, beautiful this time of year, said, hey, what do you think are Michigan's chances of repeating this year? Should we expect anything less? Yeah, you should. Michigan's not going to repeat as a national champion. Now, I never say never, so I should tell you, FanDuel has them with the eighth best odds to win the national title. Their over-under win total is nine and a half. I think it's totally unrealistic to expect that they would be in that mix again this year. Crazier things have happened. How wild is it, by the way, that Michigan played Washington for the national championship two months ago? They are numbers 129 and 130 in returning production this upcoming year. Neither head coach is still there. Uh, neither quarterback. Like, obviously, everything changed. It's one of the great Lone Star songs in 90s country. Everything's changed. And uh, they might as well have been singing about Seattle and Ann Arbor. So J.J. McCarthy out. That's your QB one. Running back one. Wide receivers one and two gone. Vast majority of that offensive line, six of the top seven are gone. They sent 18 guys to the combine. It usually means that you're going to be missing a lot of talent that did whatever you did with them the previous year. Whole new staff as well. So that doesn't mean it's the end of the road. Uh, it just means that it, well, it's, it's the end of that road. But it's the start of a new one, potentially. Just don't know how wide the road's going to be, how long the road's going to be. Alex Orgy at quarterback, fascinating. Fascinating experiment coming up here. I was reading some of Sam Webb's stuff a little while ago. Just kind of getting a gauge on what they think about him internally. If they're right about him internally, he'll probably surprise a lot of people, given how inexperienced he is with the grasp that he has on the system they run up there. So there's confidence in him internally. But that's not the first time we've heard that pre-spring about guys, and then they don't pan out. So it's not a guarantee. It's just it's what we have to go on right now. But he's inexperienced, and he's surrounded by inexperience. And that's probably the toughest part of trying to figure out what Michigan's going to be offensively this year. So what are the fair expectations? Man, I can't tell you how to think. I'll tell you, if I was a Michigan fan, I'd just be hoping not to fall off the road into the ditch this year. Don't bottom out. You know, don't go from winning the title to barely making a bowl game like TCU kind of did last year to previous year. Don't have that happen. And then whatever you are against Fresno State and Texas in weeks one and two, make sure you're a much better version than that by the time you play Northwestern and Ohio State at the end of the year. Because if that happens, if week over week progression is obvious, that means you probably have the right guys in place. Sharon Moore, right on down the rest of the assistant coaching ladder. Uh, no, I would be utterly stunned if they won a championship this year. I just hope they don't, you know, fall off the map entirely uh, because it's reasonable to expect a reset button to get hit for the team. Hopefully it's not program wide. And that's where my expectations are in Michigan right now. They're watching us in Austin, Texas, Panama City Beach, Florida and Manassas, Virginia. Thank you guys so much. Who been waiting to talk about this since I saw it pop up yesterday. Uh, do me a favor, if you're watching live, if you're listening to the pod, make sure you are subscribed to the channel. Why? Because that is how we make more money and buy Bradley the Associate lunch every day. So, if you want him to go hungry, then whatever. Shirk your responsibilities as a viewer or listener and don't subscribe. I ask that you have a heart this 2024 and, and provide Bradley a meal with just one subscription you could feed a child in need. Boy, oh boy, Johnny Menzel has done it now. Douglas hit me up and said, how do you feel about Johnny Menzel boycotting the Heisman ceremony until they let Reggie Bush back into the fold? Well, I love it with a capital L. Love it. Let me tell you something. I don't talk about the Heisman much, as you've noticed. Um, I'm not going to say it's always been because of Reggie, I've been turned off for a long time because of how they've handled the Reggie Bush thing. So when I saw Johnny Manziel say this, I went huge fist bump. I got a feeling on this. I got a pretty strong feeling. 
Reggie Bush is going to end up getting that Heisman back. And let me tell you why. I got two reasons. Number one, because everyone knows it's dumb to begin with. But even if you disagree with me on that and you say, no, there are valid reasons, what are they? Because I'll tell you what was the valid reason. The Heisman Trust a couple of years ago came out and said, we'd be happy to take him back if the NCAA reinstates his numbers. But when they when they levied the sanctions against USC and they revoked all the wins, it also revoked Reggie Bush's numbers and they found him guilty of impermissible benefits. Yep, got you there. You don't need to reschool me on that. But in case you haven't noticed, in the language of this award where it says the recipient must be in compliance with bylaws defining a student athlete, federal courts have totally torched that. It was BS the entire time. Not according to JP, according to the federal courts. And so the NCAA is not going to change this. Like they're on the record as saying we're not going back. We're not revisiting old cases. The sanctions that we levied out in one model once upon a time are there. It doesn't matter what changed in the future. I get that logic. But there's a big difference in saying what once was illegal is now legal. But if you ran afoul of the law when it was illegal... You deserve your punishment. We can't retroactively take your punishment away. That's true unless federal courts come along and say, no, 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 no. It was always BS. It was always a charade. It never was legal. That's why you have class action lawsuits being brought against you. So if you're the Heisman Trust, you can do one of two things. You can either hide behind that scapegoat of, well, hey, we're happy to do it if the NCAA does it, or you can stop waiting for the NCAA to do the right thing. You see my friend here? You see the skeleton? That dude. And this is what it looks like when you're waiting for the NCAA to do the right thing. Imagine waiting for the NCAA to do the right thing when it comes to how you hand out your own trophy. You don't need the NCAA. You never did need the NCAA. And it's about as simple a win as you can get. Do it. Because what you don't want is what I think is about to happen. Johnny Manziel's not, Johnny Manziel's not going to be the last guy to take this stand. Uh, he's the first one. But you really think Johnny Manziel is the only guy on that stage of Heisman Trophy former winners who feel the way they do about Reggie Bush? Like you really think that you won't have more guys probably as early as Monday of next week step out and say, yeah, I'm with Johnny Menzel. If we don't overturn this thing, if Reggie Bush is not there in December in New York City with us on stage, consider me a no-show. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. So you can either wait until the 11th hour and have egg all over your face or go ahead and do the right thing and overturn a decision that should have been overturned a long time ago. Reggie Bush, by the way, got 91.77% of total points in 05. The only person to ever win the Heisman Trophy with a higher point total is Joe Burrow. So I think Manziel said Reggie Bush is the Heisman Trophy. He pretty much is. He pretty much is the definition of the Heisman Trophy. Um, If you want to have some fun later tonight and, and you're 16 years old, just go watch the highlights, man. Just go watch the highlights. People, people, um, I imagine sometimes like folks who didn't watch college football or football in general, and they just kind of, because their buddies are watching college football, they just happen to see a game. And the first thing they see is Reggie Bush and think to themselves, whoa, college football players are like that? No, no, they're not. One of them is. Reggie Bush was one of one and belongs on that stage in December. And if he's not there, um, I hope Johnny Menzel's not the only one who doesn't show up. That's all I have to say about that. Moving on. Oh, we went, oh, you know what? Thank you, Colin, for putting this up back here. I almost forgot about this. I have a meeting with the folks at FanDuel this week, and I would not be opposed to them issuing just a little prop bet. Low limits, but a little prop bet. Will Reggie Bush ever get that Heisman back? What would the odds be? I'm going to have to text them that. Anyway, uh, that is the one-stop shop. They are the exclusive odds provider of our show. We really appreciate FanDuel. We're, I'm meeting with them this week to actually discuss more ideas that we have for this upcoming season. I think it's going to be really fun. Like, we're, we're teetering on, on getting the green light on some ideas that I think will be some of the most awesome features that we have on our show. Uh, that's the benefit of partnering with the biggest online sports book in the United States of America. So we really appreciate them. Proud to partner with them. And right now, you don't have to wait. We got odds on the upcoming season. Uh, We're going to have Heisman odds coming up. 
if you are inclined to bet such things. We got conference championship odds. We got early season individual game odds. I mean, you can go bet Texas at Michigan right now if you want to. So check them out. Tell them I sent you. It doesn't necessarily mean anything, but tell them I sent you. It just makes the show look good. All right. I wanted to wrap up the show by just peeling the curtain back a little bit on something we did last week. Colin, here's a good end point for you. Oh, never mind. We had a question. All right. So uh, one of our buddies from Macon, Georgia said, hey, give us the inside scoop on that trip to Georgia. How was it like behind the scenes? Happy to do so as much as I can. I, I wish so badly that I could take you guys with me on some of these trips. I do as much as I can with the Instagram story at Late Kick Josh. Uh, but you would not believe the intensity in these places. Georgia as much as anyone. The intensity in that building in late February, off the charts. You can't have a mail-it-in day. Think about your place of business. Wherever you were. You could drive a Pepsi truck, for all I know. You could work for an insurance company. There are days where you show up to work, you just don't have it, and it's okay, you'll just make up for it tomorrow. It's, it doesn't exist there. It doesn't exist there. Everyone's walking a tightrope every single minute of every day. Everyone's moving in the facility with the exact same purpose. It's like, uh, I love trains. It's like watching a freight train move by at 60 miles an hour, and every car is going the exact same direction and exact same destination in mind. But the intensity you would expect in the middle of a game week in October or November, it's like that year round. It's like that year round. The only two places that I've ever felt it to that degree are Bama under Saban, Georgia under Smart. Obviously, a lot of connectivity there, a lot of connective tissue. And a lot of the folks at one place have worked at the other place. Uh, It's amazing. It's amazing. You, you feel a heightened sense of awareness, even though, like, I'm not on the staff. I have nothing to do with their operation. But when you're in the building doing work of your own, just in that environment, just being plugged in that environment and immersed in that kind of culture, if, even for a day, it impacts you. Not in a negative way either. The lengths and the detail that they go to for their culture building stand out to me a whole lot. I won't delve into details because a lot of that stuff we get access to with the trade-off that we shut our mouths about it. But just suffice it to say, when you watch them in the fall, it's not an accident the way they play. They got really talented football players. They got the best coaching staff in the SEC. But the culture's rock solid too. That's why if you'll remember this time last year, there were some negative headlines about the program. Uh, They had problems with like street racing and they had had tragedy happen earlier in the year. And then subsequently they had some guys get in trouble, which they handled internally. But uh, there was a certain publication in the state that came out and accused them of a lot of stuff that was false. And the people responsible for that have since been fired. That's how false it was. But the accusation of them having a culture problem, they took it really personally because they didn't have one. Uh, they, had, they had problems, but it wasn't a culture. It wasn't rooted in bad culture. The reason they took it so personal is because they've actually been as aggressive as any program out there in installing culture building in the positive direction. And you see it when you go in there. It's just most people don't get that access. But it's pretty impressive. And you're talking about taking time away from football activities to do that stuff, too. You don't get to add hours in the day. you got to decide. We're, we're reallocating. Because that stuff's that important. The staff churn, we got to see it. We got to see it because when I was over there last week, it's right when Del McGee had left, the running backs coach had left, to take the head coaching job at Georgia State. Now, they love that. They love that. I mean, most of these big-time programs have support staffs where virtually every guy wants to either be a coordinator or head coach one day. They're all alphas. That's how they hire. Uh, That's the makeup of most of those staffs. Georgia's no different. Uh, So, I mean, everyone is ecstatic for Del McGee, former coach at Carver of Columbus down there in my backyard. But when those coaches leave, they know how good your building is, and they want to take as many guys from that building as they can. And that's always a fun little delicate balance to observe of we're, we're happy to help the guy off to his next job, and then as soon as he gets it, hey, don't look back here. 
You don't want any of these guys. No, no, you go hire from somewhere else. And it's, um, it's, it's delicate. It's delicate and got to observe a little bit of that last week. But um, that's college football, man. That happens everywhere. Um, the misconception also of whining versus legit concern. It's something we touched on with Kirby when we talked to him. And it's something that every time I talk with coaches, it's always reinforced is right now parts of the sport are a mess. And so a lot of coaches are complaining about it. Complaining sometimes is, all, is misconstrued across the board as whining. And the thinking, obviously, is, well, you get paid a lot of money, deal with it. Which, on one hand, is an understandable attitude. But on the other hand, what I try and emphasize, because of the guys that we're around or talking to a lot, is, no, a lot of them aren't whining. In fact, a lot of them kind of love the grind. Like, they're happy to embrace that. They're not looking, not looking for you to take work off their plate or anything like that. Kirby put it really well last week. He said, I don't care about the rest of it. If I could just know who's on my team for a year, that'd be fine. Everything else, we'll deal with it. It's hard work. It's what we get paid for. If you could just tell me who's going to be on my team for that year, not four years, that year, I'd be okay. I, I agree with him. That's not, the, um, that's not the boldest ask. That's not the tallest ask in the world to just want to know who's on your team. And there are a million different loopholes and a bunch of red tape around that statement. But from 10,000 feet, I think it's pretty valid. There's not, there wasn't a lot of, man, I wish they'd install another dead period. Man, I wish I could take another vacation. It wasn't anything like that. Some of these dudes, if they had more vacation, would still come into the office uh, because that's just the nomadic lifestyle they live. So I thought some valid concerns were raised and, and some tangible reasons were given on that front. And I will also tell you guys this. Now, mainly Georgia fans will care about this. Uh, Georgia, Georgia just landed the number one recruiting class in the country. You know that. Uh, they, they got some guys out of the portal. You know that. Ben Urasek is a tight end from Stanford. I keep an eye on him. I think they like him a lot. And therefore, I think I like him a lot. So just keep an eye on the old tight end from Stanford. He was banged up last year, had a little shoulder issue, I think. So he didn't put up big numbers last year. Uh, but they got him in there. And obviously, they've got a deep tight end room already. But that one's a little bit different, a little bit different skill set. So just keep an eye on him. Ben, you're a sec. All right, that's our show tonight. I appreciate it so much. We'll have a full mailbag podcast coming your way sometime Tuesday. We'll be back here for Late Kick Live Thursday night. We had about as varied a show tonight as we could have. We went in every single direction imaginable. We do it all year. We do not take vacations. There's no off season. If you enjoy it, you don't have to pay a dime. All we ask you to do is subscribe to the channel and get five of your friends to do the same. Because if you've ever said, I'm tired of the way so-and-so is covering college football, don't complain about it, but then have alternatives available out there and not support it. Now, if it's us you're complaining about, I don't have much to tell you. We're sorry, I guess. But if you enjoy the approach that we're taking here, wonderful, and we love it, and we love to have you. Just make sure you subscribe to the channel. It's free. That's what helps us. And do the same on podcast. For Direct Colin, Producer Jesse, I'm Josh Pate. Take care. Have a great start to your week, and God bless. 